Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Amazing Podcast. I'm Twain Taylor, editor at Amazing. And we bring you the latest and the greatest from the Kubernetes and cloud native space. If you're wondering who Amazic is, uh, we are a software distributor that works primarily in the EU region. Uh, so if you if you're listening to this and you're one of the vendors, that, you're one of the vendors that's building a product, uh, a software product that you want to get to market uh, and maybe reach more customers in, in the EU, then uh, get in touch with us. We can give you. Uh, greater reach. And on the other hand, if uh, you're a, a practitioner organization that's looking to implement some of these software tools uh, into your enterprise, then contact us even then because uh, we can uh, work with you to uh, uh, suggest uh, solutions that will work just for your business and really make the entire process of of, of getting that software and, and uh, integrating it into your stack really simple. So, so get in touch with us if if you uh, are interested to know more about uh, tooling in, in the cloud native and Kubernetes space. Uh, that said, uh, I am excited about today's conversation we're going to be having with Matthew LeRae. He's the co-founder and CTO at SpeedScale. Uh, Matt, it's great to have you with us. Thanks for joining. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm great to be here. All right. So, uh, Matt, yeah, we're going to talk about all things platform engineering today and a bit about uh, testing and simulation and all of those things. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to ask uh, a bit about yourself, your background, and your journey up to founding SpeedScale. Tell us about yourself. Sure, sure. It's my favorite topic. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. The, uh, so Matt Luray, co-founder, CTO of SpeedScale. Um, I spent, have spent about 25 years in the performance space. So performance can mean application performance. Back in the beginning of my career, it uh, actually meant infrastructure performance, um, like actually laying the cables for the internet, if you go back that far. Uh, so, <laughs> But um, I worked at a bunch of the observability uh, companies and worked in that space for a long time. Um, and, you like, know, kind of- which ones? Oh, I worked at a, uh, one, of the, one of the early ones called Wiley Technology, which the founders of Wiley went off to find New Relic later as a connection, mm -hmm. and then worked oh, at okay. CA, which is now Broadcom, at, uh, on the APM products. So, oh, um, okay. yeah, and then Observe, which was a offshoot of Snowflake Computing. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I guess that qualifies me to have an opinion about performance. Mm -hmm. But uh, so. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so I've been doing that for a long time. I worked with one, my uh, my business partners and co-founders, uh, Ken Aaron's and Nate Lee. We worked together at various startups. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of, uh, it's it's germane to this conversation because how we came about, you know, developing speed scale is also kind of how the the markets developed a little bit around performance and uh, quality, I should say. So mm -hmm. um, we uh, we all did did some stint in the observability and monitoring space, and then uh, Ken and Nate went to a company called ITKO, which was a service mocking company. Now, if you're familiar with previous generations of technology, there used to be you know, a heavy emphasis on testing. It has a lot of times manual testing. And whenever you run tests, you have to have something to uh, provide some sort of simulation of backend systems. And so the beginning of that was something called service virtualization. Uh, so what we did with SpeedScale is we took, we took uh, service virtualization, that idea, that concept of automatically simulating backend systems, and then we also took uh, the idea of a monitoring agent that was always listening, and we put them together and figured out we could start envir uh, replicating environments. So we decided to start SpeedScale, and it's just been unlimited su success and riches since. And mm -hmm. if you believe me, uh, then uh, you don't know what startups are like. So uh, it's uh, mm -hmm. but we're, we're having a good time. It turns out that it's a uh, it actually solves a real problem. So we're pretty happy with it. Well, how long has it been? We did. Let's see. We did Y Combinator about. Four years ago so yeah we've been around for a little over four years now so 2020 uh we have impeccable timing as a startup so we started the company right before covid so uh mm -hmm. follow me for more life tips or investment advice on uh how, how to make everything extremely difficult in your life so uh, yeah we started to go right before covid you know so the, <laughs> that's the bad side of that was that uh obviously everybody shut down and we lost maybe lost a year right in the way of thinking about it but uh the upside of it was is that it forced us to go into like a deep research mode where we could mm -hmm. really kind of come from the ground up on the on the overall problem and 
what we really want to do is not make another testing tool, not make another quality tool. Instead, do something that kind of hasn't been done before. And so uh, we got an extra year to think about it. So I uh, see this is me looking at the bright side, always looking at the positive and things. So anyway. All right. So are you guys funded? Which round are you guys in? Which series? Uh, so we have done a, a, a fairly large seed round of around $10 million. We were backed by Y Combinator, as well as uh, Sierra Ventures and Tech Square Ventures, as well as uh, Soma Capital, GrowTuck, and a bunch of others as well. So we're West Coast and East Coast funded. Um, okay. I personally hail from, uh, I, I, went to, I went to school at Georgia Tech in Atlanta and then went to Silicon Valley. So I was out there for many years. So I'm kind of from everywhere. <laughs> All right. Wow. That's quite an intro. Uh, looking forward to sharing your thoughts on platform engineering because many of the guests we've had on the show uh, have been talking about it. So it's clearly something that really resonates with uh, people in the ecosystem. And uh, different different vendors are taking different routes to solve for platform engineering. And obviously, it is a complex uh, problem to solve and there's many aspects to it. But the approach that speed scale seems to be taking is around environments and particularly environment replication. So uh, could you uh, kind of get us uh, started with talking about this as uh, a topic? What, what are some of the challenges uh, with platform engineering that environment replication uh, is relevant to? How, how, how's, how are they two connected? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, So if you go back to the early days of cloud, like when the cloud was coming on the scene, um, everybody said we have to deploy faster. And so we spent, I think, a lot of the last five, maybe 10 years trying to figure out how to deploy very quickly. And uh, that's great. And But that has come with some trade-offs. So what I think of platform engineering as being is sort of the, the catch-all for everything related to the um, the environment the application runs in, whatever applications those are, as well as the people and processes surrounding that platform to make it operational and easy to develop on. So you get a lot of random things, uh, I think, in platform engineering. We're all kind of figuring out what it means. Uh, you know, it's it's still being defined, of course. Uh, it definitely includes things like monitoring tools or observability tools. That seems to be in platform engineering. Uh, it probably includes things like backstage, like your internal developer portals or IDP. And I believe it will include something like speed scale. So the, the thing with all of this stuff in platform engineering is it is all, I think, an attempt to automate something that already exists. So we took something in the software development lifecycle that was horrible and terrible and that no one wanted to be doing. And then we automated it and we gave it to the platform team. And so the platform team comes along and says, well, uh, we can only automate this up to a certain point. And that's as basically as good as the technology gets at this point. But I think that the objective is, is to have a single, you know, like a single point where you can come and get basically everything a developer or an uh, engineer operator needs to do their job. And so, um, so anyway, I, I don't know. I'm interested to hear what other people have defined platform engineering as, because maybe I can learn something. Uh, but that's how that's kind of how we're bringing it together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. So environments, right? Uh, what kind of environments are we talking about? And, uh, you know, what are some of the challenges with just uh, creating these environments? And just operationally, what does it mean to manage environments? Okay, so generally, there's a crawl, walk, run, right? When you're managing environments, uh, platforms. So the crawl version is usually that you're going to have three uh, separate defined environments that you can use for various purposes. So the traditional definition, you might have development, staging, and production. We've all seen some variation of this. Well, mm -hmm. platform engineering means automation. It means taking those tasks and automating them. Well, uh, most folks who have been in this industry a while realize that uh, if you have a staging environment at all, you're lucky, uh, but you are almost certainly going to suffer because your staging environment is never going to contain uh, the right mix of you know, ingredients to actually simulate production. So the concept of environment replication is, is built upon this realization that the best way for a platform engineering team to improve developer experience, to increase development speed, is to give uh, a, give a simulation of production directly to uh, end customers. So the engineers, whatever. Instead of trying to write service mocks or trying to write tests or create come up with perfect scenarios, instead, uh, our observation at SpeedScale is that you can actually just replicate the entire production system with with a reasonable degree of fidelity, and you can find most most issues. So it's a way of essentially like it's almost like an AI agent that is what your testing team used to do. It goes and you know. You can, if you use environment replication, you can replicate the scenarios that people use because you're actually looking at what real, you know, real people do in your app. 
Um, you can figure out how the databases are used, what's in them, but only what you need because you're only looking at a certain time frame. So the, the challenge of environment replication to kind of come back to your point is um, you have to replicate the infrastructure itself. So you have to say, if you use a, you know, AWS DynamoDB, you have to have a DynamoDB instance traditionally. So you need the infrastructure. If you're using something like Kubernetes, then you need, um, you know, you need a cluster to run on and you need all the appropriate manifests that go with that. And then if you have me on the application side, you actually need all of the application data. And so what you're seeing in the industry, I think, is you're seeing this concept of preview environments or ephemeral environments. Twain, have you, have you run into that? Or do you, are you familiar with that concept? Mm, uh, no, not really. If you could explain right. that, that would be great, yeah. No problem. So what, what people said is they were in this old world where they had these three environments, right? Development, staging, and production. And they said, we got to get out of this because it's not automatable. And so what they said is, can we shrink those environments down? That's what a good scientist always does, right? Is you shrink and categorize things. And so people said, you know, reasonably said, well, let, let's see if we can replicate staging. Well, it turns out that uh, replicating staging is like really hard because you don't have the right data. You don't have databases. You don't have licenses. You don't have like cloud infrastructure. There's too much stuff, right? And so you end up with... Uh, uh, you end up with these things called preview environments, which is essentially a plat the platform engineering team provides a system that automatically spins up a small version of the application. And then you can run like a merge request through it. So like new versions of code, like a developer is building something new. Before they develop, before they deploy it, they can spin up a preview environment that will contain a minimum viable version of data that they can run. And so that's kind of the next waypoint. When people say, I don't want to be on the static three environments that just sit around, I want these ephemeral or development environments or, or their uh, preview environments. There's all these words that are floating around that all mean the same thing. Ephemeral, preview, uh, you know, stage or temporary environments. And so generally they'll put that in the CI pipeline or they'll start using those. Now that's kind of where most of the industry is now. So they've, they've adopted Kubernetes or these cloud native technologies. They realize they can't have these static testing environments or static. It just, this whole idea of testing as it used to be just doesn't fit into cloud native technology. And so they end up with this ephemeral environments. And that's how we get to like the Dora report or whatever it is that says that about half of your cloud spend just goes to development environments that never go away. So if you ever look at most cloud spending, you know, cloud uh, cloud bills for most large organizations, you get general estimate from most of your big survey reports is about half of that stuff is just environment envir or development environments that some people left running. They have maybe a piece of their app in there. Nobody knows if they can really delete it. So with SpeedScale, you know, what we kind of figured out was that if you solve the environment replication problem, and you set certain constraints around it, you don't need all that stuff anymore. And so you can start eliminating all that cloud, that extra cloud infrastructure that's always stand up for these environments. You get yourself away from the idea of development staging and prod. Of course, you still have prod, but instead you break that up into little micro environments that you can replicate, right? And so that's that's the kind of the inside of environment replication. And the challenge, the principal challenge is usually just getting the right data in there. But there's a lot of stuff that has to go right uh, for it to work right. So. Okay. Yeah, really interesting. I think yeah, you've brought in a lot of uh, anti-patterns about you know how people are trying to uh, solve the challenge of um, simulation and sort of getting real-world uh, you know results, test results, and just uh, uh, you know, before they deploy, just making sure that the deployment won't fail. And and it it's all kind of about that, you know, just making sure that uh, releases are reliable. Uh, it comes down to that at the end of it. It sounds like. Um, yeah. but yeah, uh, like, like you kind of touched on as well, the challenge is that it's costly. Uh, you mentioned the Dora report that 50% or more. Is... I'm not sure it's actually Dora, but there's a bunch of those reports, by the way, that I'll say that I have to go look up the exact one you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is. It is. So yeah, but it is, uh, a lot of wasted cloud spend, uh, that, that is an issue. And then we also talk about how, uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of overhead that gets wasted because you need to like there's more to there's more clutter uh, across your stack, um, mm -hmm. and um, and there's there's likely even performance hits because of you know uh, um, just badly architectured uh, infrastructure. So yeah. so many different uh, challenges. Uh, but what are some of the right? What's the right way to to simulate? What's the right way to replicate? And how do you get uh, close to real world? close to production simulation? So the right way to replicate is to uh, chop the problem down into uh, something that's manageable. And the way you do that, and, and the second is to stop trying to get humans to reproduce things and instead let them let the machines do what they're good at, which is uh, replicate behavior. So um, the first thing, uh, the first thing that you do to make 
uh, the problem of environment replication and manageable is you limit your time frame. And once, once you realize that I don't need to replicate the entire production database, I don't need to replicate everything happening everywhere, all the data at rest, so to speak, all I need to do is the moment you say, I'm only gonna, re I'm gonna reproduce 15 minutes of production, suddenly the problem becomes manageable. And so uh, I'll just talk about how our product works at SpeedScale. But what we do is we insert a network listener um, onto whether it's in Kubernetes or elsewhere. Kubernetes is the easiest version because Kubernetes has a lot of automation around it, but we can do it elsewhere. We listen at the network level and we watch everything. Uh, uh, let's take a particular service or application. We watch all the API calls going into it and all the calls going out of it. Now, when we say we watch everything, we mean everything. We actually will watch database calls like Postgres. We'll dissect MySQL or um, DynamoDB or BigQuery or Snowflake or whatever. All those things just work, right? Now, what SpeedScale can do is say, I want to simulate just 15 minutes of traffic um, from my production environment, and I want to use it in various ways. Now, the hard part is copying the 15 minutes of production. That's like, it's really difficult because you have to go and you have to watch the network level, then you have to reproduce something that looks like a Postgres database. Well, SpeedScale solved all this. We figured this stuff out. It's, it's a lot of magic behind the scenes, but we'll pretend to be the Postgres database or MySQL. We'll actually know what data is supposed to be where. We have no idea what the database looks like as a whole, but we know the answers to the questions during that 15 minutes in production. That's it. Well, now when you, when you, when you have the ability to dissect things that way, the environment, you're, you're able to shrink everything you need to reproduce the environment down to a few hundred megabytes. And so that means you as a developer can go and replicate a, a, a simulation of production straight on the developer desktop. Like you can copy it straight down, just run it like from a command line, uh, which we can show as a demo later, right? Um, you can go and you can run it in a cluster and have like a self-serve portal where folks can set up their own uh, rep, you know, environments replicating from production. You can keep it always up to date. So the problem we had decided to go after at SpeedScale was that data problem, getting just the data we needed during a certain set and it turns out that there are many other problems. So I'll list a few of them out there because it's not just about speed scale. Um, one of the problems is standing up the environments. So you need like part of your, your deployment tools to have like a, a test mode, special test scripts. Um, you know, another set of the problem is, uh, is just provisioning the infrastructure correctly, um, like having infrastructure as code. Many of the organizations we work with are still, um, you know, working through their infrastructure as code journey, you know, and so that makes it hard because you can't stand up environments easily. You know, there's a lot of different ones, but we decided to focus on the data one, because if you can get the data problem correctly, about 80% of the problem goes away. The other 20% is still there. But um, so getting a good copy is, uh, is, is the first part of environment replication that's very difficult. So. I think probably one of the uh, sub uh, points under that challenge is uh, dependencies, right? dependencies ah. across the system. Uh, so could you talk a bit about that? Like, how do you manage to replicate the system accurately and surface uh, dependencies uh, that, that may be hidden? So, so that's a good question. So we start from a different perspective than what most engineers are used to, but platform folks understand. Uh, we start from the perspective of a, mo of a monitoring tool. So if you understand observability, then you'll understand part of what we do. So it turns out that humans are unreliable. I'm sorry to any humans listening. Uh, I include myself in this statement, but we are unreliable. We do not tell the truth at times, and we don't even know it. We don't even know that we're not telling the truth. So we just, <laughs> so we came at it a little bit differently. Um, if you look at the way that most software engineers develop things is they go and they build a mocking engine, or they do sauce, like service mocks. They go build a bunch of tests. That's very satisfying. It feels like you did some work, but uh, but I, I don't I don't think it's a great mode, right? Like a way, great way to do this thing. Um, so we started from the inverse of that. We said, let's let's take a running version of the app, or maybe we'll read it from a spec, like a Swagger spec or an open API spec, whatever. But we need to read something. And then let's go and uh, let's figure out how it works. Well, it turns out with all the, the commotion around AI right now, right, and LLMs, it turns out our approach was timely, let's just say, because <laughs> as we observe the app, we can build a model of what it does. And mm -hmm. then we can go and, uh, uh, you know, we can make a model of what the app does. And then it turns out we can make a model of the dependencies too. So what we found, we kind of started off uh, with SpeedScale thinking, let's solve the testing problem. Like we hate writing test scripts. Um, you know, it's just not a lot of fun. Nobody wants to do it. But as we started studying it, we realized like just, just watching the app, like starting from that perspective and like building the test scripts from what the app actually does, right? Or it actually happens. That's like valuable, but it's a lot more valuable to replicate those dependencies. And so I think you're asking a little bit of a leading question in a way, but it turns out that when, you come, when it comes to ephemeral environments or environment replication or preview environments, basically the dependencies are like 80% of the work because that's where your data is. That's what you get down, you know, called to. Um, now I already talked about databases a little bit, but 
Uh, another aspect of it that isn't as obvious to folks is third-party APIs. So if you're developing, let's say you're developing a very common app where you have like a payment service, like a Stripe or something, um, it turns out like testing against those, they have a great testing environment, Stripe, right? But they will they will rate limit you, right? And also uh, they're they're gonna have a limited number of test accounts that you can do. So you're only gonna be able to get so so serious, right? With Stripe or one of those, I'm not picking on Stripe, actually Stripe, Stripe is fantastic, but I'm just saying like whatever your third-party API is, you're not exactly going to copy, make a copy of Salesforce and put it in your uh, cloud environment, right? So when you get down to simulating dependencies, a lot of what folks use Speedscale for is actually developing against these third-party dependencies that can't really be replicated. There's no way to make them exactly right. You know, you can't have a service model that is exactly right unless you actually build one from watching it. And so that's where, you know, this is like a class of problems when you get into dependencies that simulation is a much better solution than anything that's come before. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, so you've given us a hint about uh, you know the different things that uh, speed scale can be used for, uh, but yeah, I'd like to just get into talking about speed scale itself. Uh, tell us uh, what it does. It, does it only create simulated environments? Does it create the actual environments, the test and staging and prod uh, environments? Does it create those itself? Uh, could you tell us a bit more about speed scale before we dive into the demo? Sure, sure. So let me. Uh... Let me show you a picture, actually, of speed scale. That'd probably be easier. So yeah. let's see here. One second. And go. Okay. Are you able to see my uh, my little architecture yeah. diagram here? Okay. Yeah, of course. All right. So let me talk a little bit about how speed scale works. So um speed scale, kind of rehashing a little bit, speed scale is an environment replication tool. And it can be bootstrapped a lot of different ways. You can feed it like postman collections, but the most common thing to do is just to record a real running app. So think of it like training your model, right? You have to, you have to let SpeedScale listen. Now, the easiest way to do that with SpeedScale is to install in Kubernetes. So if you're moving to Kubernetes, then SpeedScale is probably for you. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's very well tailored. Um, we run something called a Kubernetes operator. Uh, now, I don't know if your audience, Twain, will be very familiar with a Kubernetes operator. Would they have some... Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, we talk a lot about Kubernetes and yeah, okay. uh, cloud yeah. Native, so yeah, that that would definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. So your operator is kind of like your your sysadmin in a box or whatever, a person you know, like a a, a process that sits along and makes sure that speed scale things are happening. So when you install the speed scale agent or operator, the Kubernetes, if you're in Kubernetes world, it's called an operator, but think of it more like an agent. When you install this agent, it can now perform tasks for you. Now. The, the, the way it's architected is pretty, seem pretty common for any engineer. We have essentially the, the actual Kubernetes operator. It's installed using Helm, if you're, in, if you're familiar with that. Um, yeah. It has an optional component called an inspector that is a lot like, a, if you've ever used Lens or like a K9S or one of these remote Kubernetes management tools, that's kind of like a, a component that allows us to do a lot of the same stuff. Um, and then we have our data ingest pipeline, pipeline, which we call the forwarder. Okay, so pretty common stuff. Uh, there are some some web hooks. If you ever want to get into deep in how Kubernetes works, I'll be happy to talk about that. But otherwise, you'll uh, it's uh, it's all pretty standard stuff. So now the operator goes and it manipulates the uh, aspects of the cluster to perform certain tasks. The two main tasks that it does is it installs a listener so that you can watch what the application is doing. Right, um, that's how we build our models. That's the easiest way. Um, the forwarder is that ingest pipeline I was talking before. It, there's only one running in the cluster, and then we install something called a sidecar to listen. Uh, for for traffic. Now this is identical to the way that Envoy works, uh, including I mean even even a lot of we can actually work alongside Envoy. Um, we also have experimental collectors like an eBPF collector. I don't know if you want to talk about that, like eBPF and all that stuff. That that's kind of an interesting development and in platform. Uh, but uh, eBPF as well as uh, you can actually even just ingest log messages. But one way or the other, that forwarder and those sidecars is supposed to get an idea of the requests going in and out of the application. And this should all be automated. Once once you install the Helm chart, it's just point and click to go and install and watch things. So does that make mm -hmm. sense so far? Yeah, yeah. So is ABPF like a non-sidecar model? Yeah, it's actually a generalized thing that's happening in the industry. Envoy is adopting it too. For their, They have like a new version of their sidecar. Um, mm -hmm. ABPF is a technology that's been around for about 20 years, but it's being repurposed for something really cool. Um, mm -hmm. ABPF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. And mm -hmm. it's been built into the Linux kernel. And what it allows you to do is essentially a uh, hook, uh, put in little listeners and watchers inside the Linux kernel in a really safe and secure way. 
And what that lets mm -hmm. you do is essentially you can you can intercept any traffic going in and out of the network stack. So mm -hmm. with eBPF, uh, you can for very, very low overhead, overhead meaning like latency or memory or CPU for very, very low overhead, you can get perfect visibility into what's going on inside of Kubernetes. So is that the same as this ambient mesh idea that Istio uh, is talking about? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's called ambient mesh. Yeah, but it's it's basically a non a less intrusive form of monitoring, eBPF. And so, uh, we are also moving along with that train. Uh, you know, we take the data from anywhere. <laughs> like we'll take it from somebody else's collector. It doesn't matter to us. What we do is the replay part. Right? Like, we don't care as long as you get in there. But e eBPF is. The issue with eBPF, so the downside of eBPF is eBPF is that you have to have a certain Linux kernel version, and you got to really know what you're doing with some of these things, like as far as building them. I think enough folks have upgraded Kubernetes, upgraded later kernel versions that eBPF is becoming more common, but that's the downside is that if you have like nodes running on some very old version of Java, there may be issues with it, you know, that kind of stuff, but slowly eBPF is becoming the de facto way. So as you said, ambient mesh with Istio, uh, a lot of the security tools Great one is like Calico, um, mm -hmm. Cilium. Yeah. Uh, these all these all have some EBF, eBPF components. So it's kind of like the future. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so the operator, our operator is running now. One thing, one cool thing about the operator is that it it collects much like your monitoring agent, except it's not designed to be a monitoring tool for like uh, for platform engineers. Believe me, you'll still want Datadog. Like you'll still want New Relic, Datadog, Grafana, all that. But what it does mm -hmm. is it allows your engineers to see inside of the cluster just well enough to know what normal looks like. So the what this operator will do uh, on one aspect is it'll watch the environment, it'll build a model, but it'll also let your engineers say, okay, like is if I done something to break production, but what it won't get into is replacing your deep log solution. You need all that stuff still, but it'll mm -hmm. get let engineers look into that. Now, once we're done ingesting data though, SpeedScale also has the ability, uh, this agent has the ability to run tests uh, different kinds of tests, not necessarily the tests you're thinking, but more generalized. So the operator can switch into a mode where it will take over resources in the cluster and allow engineers to do self-service uh, ephemeral environments. So from our UI, which I will show in just a second, uh, any engineer who has permissions and is allowed to can run a simulation to say, yeah, uh, high level, like think of it more like AI agent rather than like simple stuff. So it'll it'll actually run through some reasoning to say, um, I would like you to test, run some chaos through my backends. I want, to, I want you to simulate my environment, except I want you to make it wobbly. So like, I want you to take production for the last 24 hours. And I want to, I want to rerun production, like run the same kind of things that happen in all the scenarios, except this time I want to slow down the database, right? And it'll go do that stuff and we'll make these runs, right? And it'll, it'll basically design a test plan to go and ju judge against these OKRs. So that's what we're work we, we spend a lot of time working on. So it's it's not like we do a piece of the testing thing. It's more like we put an agent in, in your cluster and within parameters, it will go and answer questions for you about your software. Like, is it ready to release? And that's the whole idea is it says, is it ready to release? So make sense mm. so far? I'll dive into the product. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. I think uh, quite curious to see how you actually do that in, in your product itself. Sounds kind of like chat GPT style. Uh, conversation okay. if uh, if we were as clever as chat gpt i would uh i'd be talking to you from my yacht uh and there'd probably be like a disco ball here and like some music and some dancing and stuff i don't know but if i invented chat gpt believe me we there'd be my the smile on my face would be a lot a lot wider but uh no no we do use those aspects of it though we do use parts of that so let me let me just give you a brief rundown maybe a five ten minute rundown of what the product does to give you some ideas so all right, so in this particular, so you can see our product here, right? You, is that right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um, so the first thing you'll notice about our product is it installs like a monitoring tool, right? And mm -hmm. I can show you that if that's useful, but it's just some command line stuff. We run a Helm chart and we do it. Then it looks like a lot, of, lot like a monitoring tool in the beginning. In fact, we break everything down by the containers of the services that we observe, right? So right now I'm looking at the notification service. I set a time range of how, what time I'd like to look at. Is the benefit of it looking and installing like a monitoring tool that you actually don't touch what's running and you don't affect performance in any way? Is that one of the key benefits? That is, that is one of the key benefits. Yeah, is that we don't you you can observe a system without breaking it, um, okay, okay. and then you can replicate the system. So let's go through a scenario. Let's say you're going to do a lift and shift, which a lot of folks in the platform space do. They want to go and uh, let's say you're running on uh, you're running on uh, VMware, right? And now you want to switch over to running in uh, AWS, like you know. Uh, ECS or whatever. So you want to make a shift like that. 
Well, speed scale can help quite a bit because you can say, well, let, let me break that problem up and take each, each of the services. I can replicate with perfect speed all the downstream dependencies and upstream. So like I know I can hold the environment constant, which if you know about control theory and like how to debug things, it's pretty helpful. I can, I can say the database will always be the right speed. Okay, now when I shift it over to AWS or GCP or whatever, right, is it still going to perform the way it should, all things being constant? Well, SpeedScale can go and replicate the environment. You can say everything that happened in this 24 hours, um, you know, when I move it, it's going to work, right, uh, that way. So anyway, sorry, that got me off a little bit of a tangent, but yes. Um, so so anyway, um, so I'm seeing everything going through my container. And, it, and as you say, uh, our first rule is to try to do no harm, right, to the application. But we're building a model as this thing runs, essentially behind the scenes. So this is all just happening. You have inbound transactions. This is just your rate, right, to, to use monitoring terms. This is your outbound rate. Uh, here's a service map. I want to highlight one thing for those that are going to pattern match this. This is not based on open telemetry or anything you did to your code. Uh, this cannot be, uh, we cannot be lied to in the way that open telemetry can. Uh, this is actually built up from the network. So we, we're decoding the actual network conversation. So we, we didn't just make this graph up. This is exactly what the app is actually doing, right? So like we're looking at it from the conversational perspective. So we have all the traffic coming in. Here's the notification service in the middle. And then here are the services that it depends on. None of the ones that it doesn't, not everything in your production environment, not the every weird service that has ever been developed. This is the actual stuff it talks to. So from a, just a discoverability standpoint, now we know, like we know how the app actually works. Now, very different also than your monitoring tools, even if you have open telemetry turned on or APM, we'll actually show you the payloads inside of the request and the response. So when I click on an individual request, this is an inbound request to notifications hitting the chat endpoint. We have various uh, headers, you know, like HTTP headers, just standard HTTP request. And then we can actually see the bodies coming back. Now, you're not going to get this from your monitoring tool uh, because... Mm -hmm. It's not designed for this, right? It's designed for a higher level telemetry. Like it's designed to give you aggregates of like what's relative performance. It's not designed to give you this kind of fidelity, like you know, full, full, uh, full visibility. But we have to because we have to play it back. Okay. So now, over this last fifteen minute time frame, can I have I all the requests. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, can I this kind of remind me of the point you made at the start about your background in observability and just even uh, the product itself and how uh, it has roots in observability. Uh, yeah. It shows up here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. It's uh, one of the things I really like about observability tools is they they have a really hard problem to solve. Uh, the problem that, and I'm I'm complimenting all observability designers because uh, it's very hard. Uh, is you have an infinity of data and it, like it, any kind of data you can imagine, and too many people coming in with different ideas about what they want to want to build or what they want to use the data for, and trying to find some way to show it to people that makes some kind of sense is super hard. So people like they'll they'll ridicule a a Grafana or a Datadog or a New Relic, but try it sometime. It's pretty hard <laughs> like to, to, to do what they're doing. So anyway, but uh, so we copied, we copied that look. Uh, you'll notice Elasticsearch, all these tools look similar. This is not where we're innovating, if you know what I mean. What we're innovating mm -hmm. on is we show you data you don't normally have, but it's in a way you, you, you recognize it if you're used to monitoring tools. You will recognize mm -hmm. a lot of these kind of views. So, um, okay, so I'm doing my monitoring here. So you know, this is super interesting here. Uh, how about we just do the last uh, 24 hours? So I want a full, a full database replica, a full inbound traffic replica of the last 24 hours. Okay, let's just save it. So I hit save, and that's it. I've replicated the environment. Now the processing is happening on the back end. Now in the speed scale cloud right now, a, a bunch of uh, anal analysis jobs are running, right? They'll, they'll, it, it, they'll finish pretty quickly. And now I will have a portable copy of 24 hours of production for the notification service that I can use in a variety of ways. Now. Mm -hmm. First way is let's say you're you're coming from like a, a quality background, like software, you know, like you want to you want to replace your your the way you used to do testing. No problem. All you have to do is hit the replay button. Now, mm -hmm. for the Kubernetes folks, you may recall I talked about that AI or that agent or that operator running in the environment. Well, this mm -hmm. will cause our operator to take action and to start a set of simulations in kind of a, a pre-programmed script, right? Like a dance, right? A, a fully choreographed dance. So we'll go and we'll say, hey, we're, we're going to take over. Uh, let me grab one I've already got here. Um, we'll take over part of the cluster. And uh, we will go and run a series of tests that will validate latency or error rate or some other thing that we haven't even thought of, right? But we'll go and we'll work against that objective. And we'll take care of that and come back to you when we're done, OK? So 
I'm going to go ahead. I'm just going to pick one of the many available uh, clusters I have available to run things. This is like a self-serve interface that your engineers can do. So the platform team sets up this operator once, sets some constraints around it. And then from here on out, your, your developers can go and uh, run what they will. So I'm going to mess with S. Duncan uh, because he, uh, oops, because he's uh, going to be wondering what's uh, going on here when I start running replays in his Kubernetes cluster. Um, and again, this is all permission, so don't worry about that. Um, I go through, I set and say what inbound traffic I'd like to go. I select the Kubernetes workload I'd like to go against, like I'd like traffic to run events. So for the 24 hours of production traffic that I have in my snapshot, I want to replay it. And like I want to I want to drive the same kind of traffic that was going in, much like a load test script, except slightly different because we're actually simulating the whole environment. But at least the inbound part is a lot like running a load test. So I go through and do that. I can enter in custom, you know, I can change the traffic around, have it go to different places. Um, I can remotely, you know, uh, run it against an ingress, whatever. There's a million different configurations. But I also can do something that your load, your load test tool doesn't do, which we're, we're going to simulate the downstream services that are necessary. We have all the answers we need for that full 24 hours. So whatever's coming in on the front end, we know what data we need on the back end to reproduce it. So I go and turn these guys on. And what I'll end up with, I'm going to skip ahead just because we don't want to be here for an hour and a half. Um, but uh, the, while everything runs, uh, you know, in the back end, what you end up with is something that looks like, let me pull up a better one here about this. one. You end up with something that looks like a load test report. Okay. Now, if you've ever used New Relic or Datadog or Grafana, you normally get this when you run in production. You get P99, P50, P95, you know, latency. You get the throughput. How much can it handle for a particular Kubernetes? Uh, like like uh, how, much per, how much resources do you have provisioned? Well, how well will it run? We can answer all those questions. Now, the difference between those tools, like the monitoring tools, and now is I did this without breaking production. I bet that that is a trick you would like, too, if you've ever broken production. You would like to be able to test things ahead of time and uh, and not, not have it entirely break on you, right? And so that's what SpeedScale is doing, is we're giving you that ahead of time report, showing you the behavior of the app. We actually go all the way down into um, showing you side-by-side -side diffs of what's changed between what we recorded in production and what's happening when you rerun it. So like if you run through a scenario in your head a little bit, Let's say I, I'm developing a new version of my service. And uh, I am, of course, a perfect developer. So I will never break an old API because you're not supposed to do that, right? You only add things to APIs, right? You're never supposed to break old functionality. And of course, you, Twain, would never do that, right? That's impossible. You would never break uh, basic engineering principles. But let's just imagine for a second that someone did. Someone you know. Maybe it's happened to you because it's happened to us all. So um, if I go in and somebody changes like old functionality, right? Well, that'll show up in the 24 hours worth of production traffic because somebody used that functionality or seven days or whatever. There's not really that like a practical limit or there's a practical limit. There's not really a, like a serious limit. I can go through and say, are all those APIs going to calls going to work? Well, if they don't, I'll actually see the way the behavior changed. So I can go back to my merge request and see what I broke, right? So that entire process here where I showed you the traffic, hit save, hit replay, all point and click, probably 10, 10 clicks or less. And now I've replicated a full production environment for an entire day. So that's mm -hmm. kind of a five minute version of what SpeedScale does. There's many nooks and crannies. You can put it into your CI pipeline. You can make it as part of your, like every time a merge request is open, we'll go and we'll do validations on it. You can run it locally on your local desktop using the command line, which I'll actually, well, um, I could just show real quick, but anyway, uh, you can actually just say speed cuddle or speed CTL replay. You can do it all in your local box. So it's a way of kind of like giving every developer access to production safely. Um, so if you ever, if you ever heard of something like these kind of like uh, their network wiring tools, there's one called telepresence. Uh, there's a bunch of tools that allow you to try to get into the Kubernetes cluster. Have you, have you heard of these? Is it from Ambassador Labs? Or? Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, shout out to all those. There's a, a number of tools like that, but basically what those, this kind of a cool, cool idea which is that you're trying to wire a developer into production, like basically like you have an, a temporary network tap, right? So that's a really mm -hmm. neat idea. The problem is that uh, like, so basically that, think about it, that's kind of what we're doing here. The difference is we're scrubbing the data for PII. We're doing all the kind of like dedo, like there's a lot of uh, trap, like safety issues, if you know what I mean? You wouldn't want to just jack a developer straight into production. Uh, lots of weird things can happen. So we're making it a safe version of that. Um, we're allowing you to move back and forth through time. So one thing I didn't highlight is that we can go back in time like two weeks from now and pull pull something that happened in production and create an environment around it. So like we're not like we have all that stuff sort of stored. So we allow you to move back and forth in time. And then the second thing is we don't allow you to break things. So like if you get, you know, if you start messing with production, things are going to break. So so anyway, it's that kind of idea it allows you to like teleport into an environment, but safely. It's basically teleporting the environment to you. So anyway. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I think it's really cool that you can actually uh, start with something broad and figure out where something broke, yeah. even if you have no clue at all. And, you know, your system is really complex and you you yourself are not sure of every nook and cranny of your own system. You can just zoom out and, you know, pinpoint roughly where the issue is and then, you know, uh, use some of those observability uh, features to be able to drill down to exactly where and what's happening in really quick time and probably in minutes. Uh, that's really I, cool. That's very powerful. Yeah, just uh, the first time I ever, uh, we knew we kind of had something that was kind of neat was uh, I had a problem in our production system and then I, I replicated it and I ran it in Visual Studio Code because uh, I had to move off of them because my fingers just don't move as fast as they used to. But anyway, so and, and actually was able to like replay it over and over until I fixed the bug. So it was like I was replaying the same thing that had caused the breakage, right? Replaying it again and again and again. It gets my local debugger to figure out what was going on. That's the kind of stuff you can do, you know? So anyway. Uh, Neat. Uh, yeah, we're winding down, but one of the last things I want to ask is, are there any uh, ways that uh, speed scale could help with cost cutting, reducing the number of environments, anything on those lines? Yeah, so the the first thing that we can do with speed scale is stop, is stop the expansion. So... Uh, what we're what we're going through right now with a lot of companies is they'll put us into their developer portal and then they institute they institute speed scale as a way to spin up and spin down environments right on the fly. And so mm -hmm. when you get in that habit, the the environment growth uh, starts to slow down. Usually what we do after that is do a, a cost rationalization where we'll go through common developer staging environments and we find the ones that are really don't need to be there if you can replicate data because a lot of these environments exist because you have partial copies of the same databases. You know, you, you didn't have enough like leeway to copy all the dependencies. So you got a few of them working, you know, or you just were trying this one thing, you never spun it down. So then that comes kind of comes from an audit. So we do kind of a, a quick start with folks where we'll go and figure out where the low hanging fruit is that we can knock down. And then eventually we'll start spinning down a larger, kind of as a bigger project plan where we come in and we'll, uh, we'll help you start spinning down the rest of the environments. So um, yeah, we work with a lot of companies on this. Uh, the cost savings angle is the one that a lot of folks are focused on right now because everybody's trying to cut costs and get more efficient. And this is an easy way to do that, you know, um, both immediately as well as kind of getting in the muscle habit of not not exploding your cloud costs over time. So, yeah, we like to end with just talking about, uh, you know, what's ahead for uh, your product or just the ecosystem itself. Uh, but yeah, what's next? What's coming up, even if not for a specific feature? Uh, or, or uh, something that you can't talk about, but at least a broad direction of where, uh, you know, this this is all headed towards simulation, yeah. and replication, and uh, platform engineering. What's next? Yeah, so there's a couple of things that are really exciting to me right now. So uh, SpeedScale has this concept of an agent that runs things for the purposes, you know, run, runs, runs environments, essentially. Very similar to like the AI agents, right? So... A lot of what's going on in uh, the development of AI is really handy to us because it turns out that reasoning about data is a is something we do a lot of. Like we reason. I'll give you an example. In the old in like the old days, you would say, "Well, let's fuzz a field, right? Let, let's go and say we have email addresses. So let's try to break our app by giving it lots of weird email addresses. See if we can break it, right?" Well, generative AI makes that problem a little bit more interesting because you can say, "I don't just want to fuzz data. I want you to look at the existing kind of data and figure out." Uh, figure out like weird edge cases. Like LLMs can do stuff like that. That's way more useful, right? They can also make reasoning and decision make or decisions. Like what one of the things we're working on, and again, I don't want to steal too much thunder. We'll, we'll talk more about it later. But when you do run over run comparisons, uh, a lot of what that the labor involved is actually humans just reading reading events and graphs and trying to stitch things together in very common patterns. Turns out a lot of that stuff's been documented, and and uh, AI models are very good at figuring those things out, right? Now, there's when you get into the observability and monitoring space, it's hard to apply those models because everybody's infrastructure is so different, right? It's so hard to find those models. It turns out with something like speed scale, it's easier because we control the inputs and outputs. And because we can control a lot of the variables, like we can say the database will always run it at the same speed, or this will always happen in exactly this way. Like we can control these variables. Turns out that once again, uh, generative AI can be quite handy in re uh, reasoning about where to take it. So. From our perspective, when we get into that agent concept, what we want to do is stop saying, we want people to stop thinking about software quality as, a, as like a series of tests and things you do. And instead saying, here is an agent, a speed scale agent in our case, but an AI agent, you go and figure out which one of my dependencies is a problem for me. Like I want you to run a bunch of tests 
And I want you to cycle through and inject chaos in different places and figure out where my weak points are. Where's my connection code broken? Things like that. That's where we're going with speed scale is past the basics of like, let me test functionality into, I have a fully autonomous tester and the autonomous tester is doing things for me. So that's where we're going. That's where it's exciting. And that's where you kind of get into the, um, I can buy a tool like SpeedScale and seriously save 24 hours worth of work. Like you can literally do that, right? Because you don't have to design all those tests and come up with the mess, modifying the test data and doing all this weird stuff. Because we're seeing the model, we built the model, we can tweak the model, right? So it's easy. So that's kind of where we're going on that. The second area of very interesting things to me is it's still very early days with generative AI uh, for companies. So what it looks like to me, because I study this quite a bit, is that with AI, there are going to be big winners in the AI space. There's ChatGPT and NVIDIA and whoever else comes along with them, you know, Mistral and all the other ones. Whoever wins that battle, that's that's something else. But I think what, what I'm seeing a lot of the big corporations doing is they are trying to use their own proprietary data to train models. And so what's happening is there's an explosion of consulting houses that are specializing in AI projects, which really are the new version of like data aggregation projects. They're trying to aggregate their data. And once they do that, then they make AI models. Well, the thing that's interesting about that is somebody's going to have to run all that stuff. Uh, all the, all what they call, so in the AI world, they call it inferencing, but inferencing or like inferences, you know, mean like running the model, basically not, not training or building the model, but running it. I think there's going to be a lot of action around running these models. And I think there's going to be an explosion in innovation around uh, things like open EA uh, and other kinds of AI frameworks where someone is going to come out, come up with like a standard of how to operationalize a lot of these AI, AI workloads, like the standardized workloads. And I think there's going to be a lot of action around that. And I think that that is from an industry standpoint, we're going to move beyond this LLM, like the, 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 the pocket of LLM. And when it spreads out into all the companies doing it, it's going to turn into a, just a bonanza of, cool AI problems and like weird performance issues and like strange applications. Even what we're doing with SpeedScale where we're taking these LLMs and we're using them for decision-making, you just get all these cool problems you didn't have. So as a technologist, I think the next five years are gonna be really, really exciting uh, around operationalizing AI, not getting into theory. And I mean, that's for Ovid, uh, Sam Altman and those guys and God bless them, good luck. Good luck with all that. <laughs> but the rest of the economy, what we're gonna be doing is figuring out how to apply these things. So those will all be very exciting. Wow, you sounded like a VC. Uh, really cool conversation. I do uh, not have enough money to be a VC, nor do I. Am I stylish enough? So, shout out to the yeah. VCs. <laughs> but, but really interesting opinions and observations there. Uh, before you go, though, Matt, uh, you have an interesting hobby that we were chatting about just before uh, the the podcast uh, began. Uh, I was wondering if you can tell us a bit about it and even show us one of your creations. Okay. All right. Well, so my hobby and my creation, what I like to do is a uh, I like to make guitars, like build guitars. So I have a rudimentary understanding of woodworking as well as uh, plastic shaping, et cetera. So what I like to do is uh, every time we hit a milestone as a company, uh, I'm, we make a new guitar as a team. So it's like we all get together and we take all of our skills. So the last guitar we made was, I will show you, which was, this is the last speed scale guitar. And so what makes it special is that we carved the speed scale logo on the back. We burned the logo on the front. And then we made made big chunks of this guitar. So the next one we're building right now uh, is very very metal uh, for those in music. Uh, it is made out of uh, it is made out of uh, epoxy resin and and glass and like glass and like it has LED lights and all. So we're we're taking it to the next level with the speed scale guitar. Uh, this next one. So um, if you like working on guitars, then come work at Speed Scale. We are hiring. So anyway. <laughs> well, that's a cool way to celebrate milestones. Is the next one a flying V or something? It, actually, it is. It's flying V. It's a it's a see through epoxy resin flying V with uh, okay. embedded LEDs, and that's all. That's all I'm going to talk about for right now because the team's still building it. So, <laughs> <laughs> will you be uh, will you be talking about it on your blog, the speed scale blog? I I don't know. I guess maybe I will. I don't know. I guess so. Uh, they're probably going to be pretty proud of it because uh, what they're planning is is uh, is is well. Let's just say they're going to have to get someone a lot better than me to play it because it's going to be too cool for me. So anyway. <laughs> Great to see it. Uh, thanks so much, Matt. It was lovely talking to you. Uh, we hope to come back soon for a part two. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks to all of our listeners and viewers for tuning in. And we hope you enjoyed this conversation with Matt as much as I did. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.